Well, hello, Ephraim, and welcome once again, and we thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue with our teaching that we've been, we started last week on the purpose of temptation, and we're going to teach into it. We're not just going to teach uh, about it, but we're going to teach into it and trying to bring some life and some application where you can apply it and parallel some things into your, into your walk and how other people had to go through things in scripture and maybe even, you know, maybe some, I'll share some things that happened in my life. And I'm sure you can relate to different areas that have happened in your life where you've had to face things and and fight through it. And on the other side of it, there was green pastures and that's the, uh, the promised land that we're always trying to get to. So let's go to prayer and uh, we'll start off today. Father, we come before you another great day with you, Father. We thank you for it, and we thank you for what you're doing in our lives, and we thank you for what you're doing through your your people that are out there bringing forth your word, Father, and how it's spreading across the face of the earth. And right now, we take authority of every spirit of darkness, and we bind it in Yeshua's name, and what's bound on this earth is bound in heaven itself, and we release the power of the anointing to go forth to the four corners of the earth to bring this around the globe so that people can understand, Father, this God that we serve, and who you are, and how you operate. We're grateful for it. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So as you can see, we've got a chart up here, and this chart relates to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and I'm going to read that right now. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now, I'm going to go through this law of provision here, because the law of provision has everything to do with the wilderness experience that we go through. And the first point of it is, is that God always has promises, and he's got promises all the way through his scripture for his people. And those promises are always linked to a condition or they're linked to a principle within his word that we've got to do. And followed by that, we get into the problem or a temptation that follows that, that we have to battle through. And if we can battle through that, we lead to the provision. And that, I call this the the law of provision, or as our mentor brought it forward, the the law of provision, uh, provision. But unfortunately, what some people try to do is they try to jump from step one to step four. And some people even try to go backwards through this whole thing. They read in scripture that God's got a provision about something, and they automatically think that they are entitled to it. No, you've got to go through some stuff. The only thing that you're entitled to, but there's still a a temptation in that, and a testing, not even a testing period, there's a temptation that is the salvation. Salvation and the infillment of the Holy Ghost. Those are free gifts from God. But at the same time, you still have to go through this. You still have to make a decision. You still have to make a choice. But it seems to be a very easy choice to make to walk through to the provision of eternal life. But when we take this and we try to apply this to our our life here on the face of the earth, you know, it gets discombobulated sometimes when we're trying to achieve some things. And people just jump around. And you have to allow it to flow through this and let this cycle through your life and go through what it is in sequential order with this in order to come out with the provision on the other side. You're not going to start off over here that God's got a promise in his scripture, and hey, I'm just going to name it and claim it. Well, wait a second, what happened to all this down here that we have to go through? You know, the whole name it and claim it thing that came out with the Pentecostals there, what, probably in the late 70s, mid 70s, and it was just name it and claim it. Uh, No, you have to go through this to come to the provision to be able to access the promises of the Father. And that promises are his blessings. And that's what we're trying to get through on the other side of that. Now, we left off last week and we were talking, and I'll just back up a little bit. We're talking about staying attached to the Father. And while we're going, going through these issues of life down here, the problem of te- or the temptation, you know, as we go through that, we always have to remember and stay attached to the word of God and stay attached to Yeshua himself. John 15, five, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit because apart from me, you can't do anything. Now, even in this process here, because he is the living word and God's got 
provisions all the way through his scripture. He's got the living word operating through this all the time. And that is Yeshua himself came, died for our sins. But we have to remember when we're going through this, you can lean on him. See, you got somebody that's interceding for you. You got somebody, you got an advocate in your corner who can get things going for you and kick things into high gear for you. But a lot of people try to do it on their own. They come up to these temptations or these problems in life and they try to do things on their own. And you can't be successful trying to do these things on your own. John 15, 6. Unless a person remains united with me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. So branches are gathered and thrown into the fire where they are burned up. Now, I've got a bunch of trees in my yard. I had 44 of them at one point in time. I'm down a few because I was practicing on grabbing the fig tree. Just kidding. My wife would have a fit if I told her that because there are a lot of trees that are gone. But in our yard, come fall time, what happens? The leaves start to fall. And if you look at those leaves as like a type of fruit, what happens is they hit the ground. And as soon as they hit the ground, they immediately begin the process of drying up and withering up because they became detached from the root, the whole root system, which feeds that tree up through the trunk, out, out of the branches, and then you get into the fruit on the end of the, end of the leaves. And every fall, they fall and they fall all over the yard. We rake them up. Some of them we burn. Some of them we just mulch up into the lawn but it's about staying attached. And if they ever stayed attached, they would never just fall off and die. I know it's part of the tree cycle, but that's not the point I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is if within our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, if we stay attached to Yeshua, we will always be producing. We will always be producing. And if you're producing and producing the word of God, you will be producing fruit. And if you're producing fruit, great. That's what we're trying to get you to produce. That's what the, the main precept of our walk is, about producing the things of the Father. 15.7 of John, if you remain united with me and my words with you, then ask whatever you want, and it will happen for you. But this is all contingent on if you abide in him. And this will happen if you abide in him. But the problem is, you have to meet the conditions. You have to meet the conditions, and the condition there is that you abide in him, and his word abides in you. His, li his living word abides in you. His written word abides in you. And but we know we get so discombobulated with what we go through, sometimes we screw the whole process up. John 6, 28, let's jump over there. Then he asked him, what are we to do so that we may habitually be doing the works of God? habitually be doing the works of God, consistently demonstrating the power of an almighty God. And they were asking, what, 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 what do we have to do? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe. What's believe? That means to adhere to, to trust in, to rely on him, to have faith in the word of God that the faith can come to fruition. That faith can transpose from your faith, and it can be what? The evidence of faith over in this realm. And people can see that evidence in the one whom he has sent. You see, but we got to stop trying to do it ourselves. Sometimes we just got to be able to let go of the reins. Have you ever ridden a horse? And you can look at it as you know a chariot, or you can look at it as horseback. And you just let go of the reins and put your arms down, close your eyes, and see what happens. Don't do that when you're driving your car, but it would be the same thing. But at some point in time, you've got to allow God to take the steering wheel and steer and direct your life for you, while staying within the parameters of his word and making sure that it doesn't drift off into the ditch, because that's what happens when the car is out of alignment. It starts to drift one way or it'll drift the other way. The next thing you know, you're into oncoming traffic. See, you've got to be in perfect alignment with the Father to be able to let go. And that's where we've got to get our lives and keep striving, not struggling, striving to get to that point where we can just let go of the reins of life and let God take our problems and deal with our problems because that's where the problems really lie anyway. A lot of the times we try and take on problems and they're not our problems. How many times can you say, God, you've got a problem here. You need to fix it. 
But unfortunately, what sometimes happens is we back ourselves into corners by some bad decisions we make, and then we sit there and we try and blame God and say, okay, God, you got a problem here. And he's like, oh, no, I don't. You created the mess. You fix your own mess. Back over here is not what I had ever intended for you. What I wanted you to do was over here. But you didn't hear me over there. You went and made some decisions. You backed yourself into a corner. And now what have we got? Dig yourself out. Here's a shovel. Hebrews 4.1. Therefore, let us be terrified of the possibility that even though the promise of entering his rest remains, any one of you might be judged to have fallen short of it. Doesn't that seem like we've all been there at one point in time? Seems like we've fallen short. Some people, they think they've fallen short and they feel like they can never get back on path or they can never get back on track or they're not good enough. This process is not to break you. This process is not to tear you down. It's to tear some stuff out of your life and get you to realize some things but this process is about getting you closer to the Father. Remember, he's allowing you to go through some temptations over here because he trusts you and he know that, knows that you can bear it. He knows that you can handle it. He's not going to give you something and allow something to come at you that you can't handle. Sometimes he'll hold the reins back for us on some things, and sometimes he'll let them go, and we think we're going to drown. Just like Peter was, thought he was about to drown. And what happened? The living word, Jesus Christ reached down, grabbed his hand. Come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. But what he do? He jumped from realm to realm and then back to another realm too. Hebrews 4.3. Let me back up. No, oh, 4.3. That's where we're at. Sorry about that. For it is we who have trusted who enter the rest. It is just as he said, and my anger, I swore that they would not enter my rest. He swore this even though his works have been an in existence since the founding of the universe. For there is a place where it is said concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Some of his works? No, all his works. What, that's, what's it talking about there? Sabbath. It's about resting from anything that you could ordinarily do on any other day of the week, but we put it off and we get lazy on Wednesday night. We get lazy on Thursday. And the next thing you know, oh, the things are backed up on Saturday. Now I got to do it. Again, God's saying, not my problem that you're defiling my Sabbath. You had that time slot there. You had that time slot there. You had that time slot there. And you can't manage your own time and you can't manage your own house, which means how can you manage the house of God? Which means you can't. You see, you've got to be able to manage your life. You've got to be able to manage your life so that you can do the word of God and apply the word of God to your life. And once more, our present text says, they will not enter my rest. Hebrews 4, 6, therefore, since it still remains for some, some to enter, and those who received the good news earlier did not enter. And this is where some people get into trouble. Hebrews 4, 7, he again fixes a certain day, today. You know, there's not too many times in Scripture where times and dates are given, but this one's given. He again fixes a certain day. Today. Today. He was talking about today then, and I'm talking about today as in right now. Saying through David so long afterward in the, in the text already given. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later of another day. So the remains of a Sabbath keeping for God's people. For the one who has entered God's rest has also rested from his own works, and God did from his. Hebrews 4.11, and we'll stop here for the, out of Hebrews, or out of Hebrews 4. Therefore, let us do our best to enter that rest so that no one, and here's the key point of everything I just read, so that no one will fall short because of the same kind of disobedience. Do our best. Therefore, let us do our best to enter that rest. You see, do our best means there, it means to labor. It means we've got to do some work. We've got to do our due diligence. Do our best. Do your due diligence to enter that rest, which means you've got to prepare prior to. What's this got to do with this? Absolutely everything. Because it's being adherent to the word. This is about being adherent and applying the word. 
And what are we talking about? Something simple as Sabbath. But one simple thing can screw up the whole process. Can screw up the whole process when you get outside of it. But temptation, it always relates. Temptation always relates to the promise through a condition. And when there's promises that are given, there are conditions that have to be met. And what happens in this whole process? Let me break it down for you real simple. God is saying, if you do this, I will do that. It comes down to two basic principles for this whole thing when we put it all together. If you do this, then God can do what his word says. But it comes down to you doing and you doing and you doing because temptation will always present you with the opportunity to apply God's word, to apply God's word, to lean on the Father, or to ignore it. And a lot of people just ignore it. A lot of people are obtuse even when they're in this process. Can you name the purpose of temptation that you're in? You will always be going through them. You should always be looking for it. You should always, what purpose of temptation is going on in my life? You should always have one going on. Like you should always have a faith project going on. You'll always be going through this law of provision because God is tr- uses this as a vehicle to move you forward. And if you don't identify the vehicle that you're in right now, how do you know what fight you're in? You got to be able to look and see what this law is, what this provision that you're in, what God's trying to get done within your life, what he's trying to drive out of your life, seeing if you'll stand on the word of God, be able to apply through your, your problems, through your purpose of temptation. But then again, some people get so familiar with this that the problem that they're facing, they've been facing for 25, 30 years, some people, and they don't even realize that they're going through it. And they just bang up against the same wall, bang up against the same wall, bang up against the same wall. Could you imagine wandering through the the, uh, desert for 40 years and you come up to the mountain again, bang, run into the mountain, Don't ever try stepping over it. Don't ever try going around it. Don't No, walk up to it and bang your head. And that's what some people do because they don't progress past this. They can't get past that. And until they get past this, God can't use them in the next phase. And that's why you've always got to be looking to identify. Hebrews 3, 9. Yes, your fathers put me to the test. They challenged me. And they saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not understood how I do things. And this is exactly what came of it. But it says, therefore, I was disgusted with that generation. Disgusted. I don't want God to look at me in any type of disgust. But they challenged him. They challenged him. How did they challenge him? We'll get to some of those scriptures because a lot of this has to do with the wilderness experience that they went through and paralleling that wilderness experience that they went through into your life today. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'll read it one more time just for clarification. No temptation has seized you beyond what normal people experience. And God can be trusted not to allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. On the contrary, along with the temptation, he will also provide the way out that you will be able to endure. You know, when it says in scripture that narrow is the the gate and few there are that find it, that's narrow right here. Coming out of this is narrow because there's only one way to come out of it. And that's applying the absolute word directly to the problem within that you're facing. You see, but that's how God ordained growth. God ordained growth. It's contingent on temptation and passing the temptation, not failing the temptation, not like snakes and ladders where you, or monopoly where you don't pass go and you go back or snakes and ladders. You get to one certain point, then you fall down a few flights of stairs and went right back to the beginning. No, you got to beat it. You got to get through all the, all that. You got to get past the snakes that are coming around. You got to get past the things that are trying to distract you and get you away from the things of God so that you can walk through it and beat the game. Beat the game that darkness plays that so easily besets us and we partake in it. But that's, that's a choice. That's a choice. 
to keep your head up your, or your finger in your ear, or your head up your backside, I guess you could say, not very kindly. It's just gonna keep you in a, in a, in a fog. You're not gonna be able to look around. You're not gonna be able to see what's going on. You're not gonna be able to see the attack. You're not gonna be able to see what God's trying to do within your life. You'd be obtuse to it all. But passing this, that is how you break down barriers. That's how you break down barriers. Can you stand firm in the word of God? But you got to go through it. You got to learn it before you can absolutely teach the depths of it. You see, but the whole key of this is getting through, getting through, coming through, coming through, and pushing through. You're not just going to fall through like water through a funnel. No, you're going to have to inject yourself. You're going to have to force your way. You have to force the word of God through. Isn't that what Jesus Christ himself did when he was tempted? He forced his way through by relying back on the word of God, and he quoted the word of God, and he forced it. Forced it through. Just a little bit of prayer, a little bit of fasting, will help you a long way with some of this stuff. It'll help you a long way. But remember, there isn't a situation out there that'll take you down if you stand on the word. You see, but the temptation you're facing, it's the vehicle. Now, I'm going to go through five points here. And it's probably going to take me probably a good half an hour to get through these five points. I say that it'll probably take me an hour and a half now. But here's the five points. If you're going to get to the depths of God, number one, persecution is going to come. Persecution is going to come. Persecution comes in this phase right here with the problem or the temptation. Darkness will pull out any stop he can get you to fail, to fail from reaching the provision. And persecution is one thing that he will use. You don't hear that taught very much, do you? You don't hear that. Mark 4, 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when the affliction or the persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. What's this whole thing contingent on? Applying the word of God, standing on the word of God as to what the word of God says, having faith into the word of God so that it can manifest into your life. And the results can what? Be the sign, the evidence into the other world. You see, darkness isn't just going to belly up. Darkness isn't going to just roll over and say, oh, okay, you've decided to take a deeper step with God. No, because you're becoming a threat when you start doing stuff like that. You're becoming a threat to him, to his kingdom, to what he's trying to do. He's trying to drag people away from the Father. And now you're saying, hey, I'm going to get this right. Now maybe I can go teach people. Of course he's going to rise up. That's his job. That's his job since the fall. And he's not going to take you under. He can't take you under if you're standing on the word of God. But he's going to take a run at you. And when you start working the works of God, then you're going to be a major problem in his backside. And I know people out here are working the works of God, and good for you that are. Good for you. Because it takes, once again, the evidence. The evidence. The manifestations. Because God wants to take you to a higher place with him. And those are signs of what? Those are signs of power. We study that in another series when we get into that. You see, people will work the works of God once you start working the works of God, and once you start teaching them what it took to get to that point in time, you've got to get to that point in time. Just a problem. Right here. Just going through this. Just getting life figured out. And not life the way you see it. The way life that God sees your life. The second point. This whole process is bringing us to those depths for us to get to a point with God for God to be able to use us. We're moving to higher places with him. And I touched on this earlier, but if you face the same problem over and over, 
And if you see the same mountain in your life over and over, you have not identified the reason that that mountain is in its place for you. If you're facing the same situation and the same problems over and over and over, you have not identified the mountain and the reason for that mountain in front of you. You see, when they were going around in the wilderness, what did they do? They started naming the rocks. They started going round and round and round. Isn't that what we sometimes get caught up in life? You go around and you go around and you go around to the point in time, oh, different rock, but it's still a rock. It's still in the way. It's still there. You've got to come past it. And if you're looking at the same problem over and over, you haven't identified what God's trying to get done within your life. There's something that needs to change within your walk, something that needs to change within your life. But mankind says, well, it's not me. I'm perfect. It couldn't possibly be me. It's everybody else. Uh, no, God's pointing at you and saying, no, that rock is there for you. That mountain that's in your way, uh, I put that there for you. That temptation that's there, it's for you. That thing that you keep going step one, step two, step three, and then back to step one, to step two, to step three. And that can go on. And some people die with that going through that, never coming to the realization, never coming to the fullness of God's word for them. You see, they wandered over there in a, in a, in a physical desert for how many years? For 40 years. And you realize that we're wandering and we're wandering in a spiritual desert. And it goes on for years and years and years sometimes as well. You see, it's about getting it right. It's about applying it. But our wilderness, your wilderness is your problem, and my wilderness is my problem. But the wilderness is problems, is temptation, it is difficulties, it is sometimes confusion. That's called the purpose of temptation. It all falls right in here. It's about darkness throwing everything he can at you. What are you going to do with it? Stand on the word of God? Stand on the condition? Stand, stand, stand. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Again, where's that mountain at? I'm going to wear this right out. That mountain is right here, which is followed by a problem or a temptation. That's that mountain that you've got to come past. You've got to be able to speak to your problem. You've got to be able to speak to that temptation as Jesus Christ himself spoke to that temptation presented in front of him by darkness. If you will just bow down and lick my boots. And he said, nope, I'm not a boot licker. I'm a child of the almighty God. And he constantly went back and he applied the word and he applied the word and he applied the word. And that's what you've got to do. Apply the word and stand on the truth and the depth of the word. But understand, understand first and foremost why the mountain is in your life in the first place. It's about if you do this, I can do that. It's the principle into the greater depths of God's kingdom. It's about going from one threshold to the next threshold. You see, but what happened was our, our brothers, our brothers back in, the, in, in Israel, Back in the desert time, what they do? They question the validity of God's word. They question the condition. They question the promise. They question the whole process. They question the promise. They question the condition. Well, they were in the wilderness. Do we do that when we're in our spiritual wilderness? Do we question the promise that God has, that God said? Do we question or can we stand? And can we believe? Confront it. Confront it. This process here is going to come to blows at some point in time with darkness. You're going to, you're going to have to confront it. And that's why I've been on people about standing up. 
Because darkness will make a run at you right at this point in time. What are you going to do? Are you going to belly up? Show them your soft side so that you can be lashed? Or are you going to buck up, step up to the plate? Apply the word of God. Fight. Put things in place. Put darkness in its place. If it's within, it's a person, whether it's a place, whether it's a thing. However, darkness is going to try and manipulate you to get away from the provision. To use every antic possible to keep you down. Beat it. Beat it. But you're going to run into it. But beat the mountain. Don't bang your head on the mountain. Don't bang your head on the mountain. Some people will go through life for, I said it already, 40 years and do the same thing over and over and over. You know what that is? It's basically the definition of insanity. But they weren't going into the promised land back then at that point in time until they fulfilled what God had what? Commanded them. God had commanded them. Now we're in the first part of the process here. Here's, the, here's God says, I got this. But you know what? You got commandments to follow. You got commandments to follow. There's rules to the game. There's rules to every game with God. You see, but they weren't going until they would what? Absolutely fulfilled. And what happened? A whole generation had to die off because of what? Oh, the heart gets in the way in this process too now. Good thing we just taught about the heart before we went through this so that we can have a deeper understanding into what we're talking about here. You see, but sometimes people sit back and sometimes people wait for the promise. They wait for the promise. They wait for the promise. And then it goes what through. Then they choose poorly and they choose poorly and they choose poorly and they get to here and they choose poorly and they get choose poorly and they choose poorly and they choose poorly. And sometimes darkness doesn't even have to get involved because of our poor choices in life. All we have to do is choose wisely, apply the depth of the scripture, the depth of the scripture, not just what you superficially read sometimes, the depth of the scripture, and then see what happens and see what kind of result you can come up with because God is result-based. This, the provision, is a result. This is an evidence on the face of this earth for glory to go to him so that people can see the evidence it's like this evidence of speaking in tongues. You're filled with the Holy Ghost, but the evidence on the face of this earth so that people can understand from realm to realm to realm. Proverbs 21, or 20, verse 21. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. Too much too soon in anything, good or bad, it'll take you under. And that's why God's got this process. Because sometimes he has to speed us up. Sometimes he has to try to slow us down. Because sometimes if we get too much too quick, what we can ruin it. But then again, if we don't move our feet, we stand still like a pillar of salt. Eventually we crumble and we're absolutely useless anyway. You've got to keep going in God's cadence and his timing. But what happens is sometimes we get ahead of God. What happens when we get ahead of God? Well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Too much too soon. You see, it's... We live in an instant society. We want instant everything. We want everything fast. We want it that quick. We don't want to plan anything out to a depth anymore. It's like we want something. We want to run to Walmart and we just get it. What about ever happened with saving up? What happened to those things? No, now instead of saving up, we have a thing called debt. We have a thing called debt. And what happens? We get into debt. Then you start owing the man again. And then people accumulate more debt. Why? Because they go through stuff right here. They get stuck. And then they, they wallow in it right here. You see, God's got provisions for blessings. Provisions for blessing, but we get into this instant, I want, I want, I want. You know, there used to be a thing out there, and I know it's still around, but it's so god-awful, they probably don't even sell it much anymore. They got this thing called instant coffee. 
You take a little scoop of coffee, you put it in some hot water, and you've got an instant cup of, hot, of, of coffee. Well, whatever happened, and this is the way I enjoy my coffee, I get up in the morning, I pour the water into the coffee pot, I hit the, the grinder on the beans. It grinds it all up. I take the beans, I put the beans in the coffee pot, and I get a real true cup of coffee right in front of my face. I saw it go from the bean into the powder, into the coffee maker, and I just look at that and I just like, this one's mine, the whole pot. It's, but we don't go through that anymore in life. We want instant, instant, instant. An instant anything is not a reality. It's not real coffee. It's not a reality of the way that God does things. It's always been what? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And that's why sometimes we get into problems when we get into mega churches. They go from what? Being small, and then the next thing you know, they just blow up, and it's like they can't handle it. They can't handle it. And I know some have been developed over years and years and years and years. But when we get into the works of God, it's going to start off. It's going to start off you laying hands on your family. It's going to start off the small things within life. You know, see, that because people, people are, by nature, I don't even like to use this word, but people by nature sometimes get stupid. Especially when it comes to the spiritual things. Especially when it comes to the gifts. Especially when they start to manufacture some of the gifts. Especially when familiar spirits get involved. Because people are having dreams and sometimes the so-called visions. You know, what, you know why one of the easiest ways to judge, bad word, to evaluate, even worse word, on their behalf, they're usually flakes. And the, one of the easiest ways to see that is because there's no power that goes along with it. They can't transmit the power from one side into the other side. So how do you think God's going to allow them to transmit the power and use them for visions and dreams and all the other stuff while they're still powerless? It's got to operate, what, line upon line, precept upon precept. Everything in your life moves up. You get closer and closer to God in everything. It's not just out of balance over here and over here, and I'm just going to have a dream and a vision. And I just had a dream, and then I'm going to just go out and, oh, I should tell the entire nation about this dream. But they can't produce anything. Or God's using me here, but I, there's no evidence of anything else. No evidence. It comes down to evidence. And this isn't about being a, a doubting Thomas. This is about the way that the kingdom of God works. You see, but by the time people get through it, who have done it right, who have taken time to build and to build and build, line upon line, precept upon precept, it's really not that big of a deal at the end of it because there's been a price that's had to been paid for it. There's been a price. Sometimes it's a lifelong price. This is a race that we live until the end, but we're always going to be striving from glory to glory to glory in the way that I see it. When you leave the face of this earth, you're entering the last glory. But it's about getting there. You see, you can do anything on the face of this earth. You can do it as long as you line up with the word of God. You see, but back in the, the days when they were wandering, they could have very easily have forgotten God. And Moses warned them. He gave them a few warnings, and I'll rattle a few of them off here. Because he was talking about receiving riches, rather, you know, getting fat, getting full. And then they would, what, stop serving him. They could easily have forgotten God. It's easy to forget God when things are going good for you. It's very easy to get distracted by it. When you're having a good time in life, it's easy to forget about God. You know what? Darkness has you nicely distracted. He's just going to kind of lead you over. Oh, my marriage was rough before, but now my marriage is going really good. And next thing you know, you're not even going to church anymore. And you're away from the things of the Father. And it's just, just slowly disintegrating. Oh, but my marriage is really good now, but it wasn't before. Slowly and slowly disintegrating your relationship with the Father. You've got to grow in one. You've got to grow in unison. The second point out of this one, out of Israel, and what more Moses was warning, they, they could attribute their good life to the source other than God. You see, it, we could do that too. It could be our job. For some people, it could be schooling. For some people, it could be your success in life. Whatever it be, you have to keep 
your eye on the true source of why you have those things. That is a principle of the kingdom of God because he is the giver and he is the taker. And at some point in time, if you're not living and walking with him and you're trying to do this alone, thinking it's your job, thinking it's your schooling, thinking it's your success, thinking it was what they did when they were in the wilderness to survive, you're done. Because the time will come when God's going to what? Take it all away from the heathen and hand it over to those who are operating in the law of provision, who have this in God's cadence, not their own cadence, in God's cadence, who don't get behind God and don't get ahead of God. Those who are in sequence with God in a balanced relationship, in a balanced walk. You see, because there's going to be a cutting off period for all of that. And he'll bring the blessings back from the heathen. Right now, it's kind of just drooping out over there, all over there. But you can see it's starting to be gathered. You can see the process. You can see how God is starting to do that. And that process will be cut off, and the heathen will not receive the blessings. Because there are blessings on the face of this earth that anybody can attain because of the principles of the kingdom. And if you apply the principles of the kingdom, even being a heathen, God will still honor his word. But he said that there's a point in time where I'm going to cut that off. And we're approaching those points in times. Another one, the third one, that they were warned of, warned of by Moses, that they could provoke God by trying his patience. Have you ever provoked God? Have you ever tried to back God into a corner and then tell him to dance? Sure, we could all put our hand up. Again, what were we talking about before, about decision-making? Sometimes we make bad decisions and bad decisions and then say, okay, God, you got a problem. And he's like, no, I don't. Here's your shovel. Dig yourself out of it. It's your own decisions. That's not what I wanted. I wanted you to go this way over here. But you decided. You chose. You see, God gets tired of people not adhering to his word and his ways. And that's provoking God. That's how you provoke him. You see, one thing that gets involved with a lot of provoking God, selfishness gets involved with a lot with that. Because he's got commandments. You know, what are we we're commanded to do? What? Things like take care of the widows, take care of the, the elderly. You know, go visit the sick. And some people, well, my favorite show's on, and I can't go out here, and I can't do that, and I can't do this. That's selfishness. You're being selfish with your own time. When's the last time you picked up the phone and just said to somebody, hey, how you doing? That's not being selfish with your time. There's always somebody on, our, on our, the phone in our house. We're always talking to people, constantly ministering to people, talking to people about the things of God, helping them through their purpose of temptation, explaining different scenarios, giving advice, and sometimes receiving advice. Sometimes getting counseled with and sometimes counseling, counseling with others. There's always things going on, but you have to participate and you have to make time. And time can be the one thing that we get really selfish about. But remember, it's the willing. It's the willing and the obedient that will partake of the fruit of the land. It is the willing and the obedient who will stay attached to the vine. It's the willing and the obedient that won't be pruned off. You know, and sometimes people get mad. They get mad at me for things that I say. They don't like to hear some of the things that I say, but if it's on my heart and it's on my mind and if it's being inspired, guess what? I'm going to speak it because I've got an obligation. I've got a responsibility as well to be obedient to the Father. The fourth one there, they tested and they tempted God. How did they do that? Because Israel was asking for more than what God was willing for them to have at that point in time. I'm talking about getting ahead of God now. They wanted more than what God was willing and what God wanted for them to have at the time because he knew that if they had more than what they could handle, they would screw this whole thing up. That's getting ahead of God. That's trying to lead God and then demand that he perform for you like he's some kind of damn puppet 
No. You are to be led by God, not get ahead of God and not lead God. That's trying to play God. And that's dangerous, dangerous territory. Dangerous territory. You see, but then we get into people who start demanding things from God and when God's not ready to, for them to have it. You have to go through the process. You have to get from glory to glory to glory in order for things to happen. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Too much too soon will sink your boat. Not enough at the same time will sink your boat. It's about balance. It's about having the whole thing in balance. And just like people demanding miracles out of Jesus Christ. Well, I prayed and I demanded. And I've heard of people fasting for 40 days and then start demanding things. And this is a true story by somebody that I know, a relative of mine. Years and years, I'm talking decades ago, fasted 40 days, expected God to jump when he snapped his fingers at the end of it, and it didn't happen. And guess what? He slowly started to wean away and wean away and wean away from the things of the Father. Sad? Yeah, sad. Very sad. Very sad for his family as well. But the whole thing comes down to God's timing. In God's timing. You see, because when riches and when spiritual riches come or material riches come, you have to be able to handle them. You have to be able to handle them. What would have happened if they would have just got everything as soon as they walked out in the desert? God would have lost him. He lost him anyway. But he got the next generation. He got the next generation, didn't he? And that's what matters, is that his people continue to grow and continue to move things forward. You see, there's, there's, there's rules to this whole thing. You know, you look at power. There's rules to power. Recently, my dad was using a power tool. And he decided that he was going to cut a piece of steel at home. He's putzing around the house and he has an angle grinder up. He's cutting a piece of steel and it jumps back and it hits him and it cuts him. And he's got gash up here, 15 stitches in his hand because there's rules to using power tools. There's rules to using power tools and there's rules to using God's power. And if you do it wrong, sometimes it can jump back and it can bite you. If you make an error, if you take your eye off of it for one second, sometimes it can jump back and bite you and something else can get involved. Something else can get involved. And now you've got a real mess on your hands. But also misusing the power. And what happens? Sometimes you can lose a finger. Sometimes you get cut really deep. Sometimes God's got to use that sometimes as well to cut the calluses off your heart cut the calluses off your heart, which holds you back. You see, and that's why I say, if you keep going back and you got the same problem year after year after year, if you've got the same problems now that you had a year and a half ago, two years ago, you're going around the wilderness. You're going around the wilderness. You're going around the wilderness. And you have to figure out how to come out of the wilderness. The next one, the fifth one. Taking pride in suffering or poverty is just as absolutely disastrous as getting yourself wrapped up in the riches and the high places. You realize the consequences of that? The woe is me, I'm poor, I'm broken, I'm depressed, and I've got to give it all up for God, and I've got to do this, and I've got to just be the epitome in the armpit of the world. Is that what God really wanted for you? Oh, he wanted you to give up everything and follow him. He didn't want you to mope around. He didn't want you to think and live in poverty. He wants his people blessed. He promised it to his people. He made conditions and principles to get it. There's problems and temptations to defeat. And then you can get over to the provisions. See, this may take, this is God's timing on this. You may have a two-year problem to go through this. You may have a 10-minute a, a window to get through, get through this. But you've got to live it. To whom much is given, much is required. You see, but you've got to work, worry about 
what this little thing under your mouth is saying too. You see, there are positive confessions out there, but you've got to understand where you are absolutely walking with God. Because some people are absolutely living in an absolute fantasy bubble sometimes. You see, do you say you're sick when you're not are? When, or say you're sick when you're not? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. You see, I understand what it talks about in Scripture about speaking those things. But it says about standing on the Word of God. Scripture doesn't say, speak those things that are not as though they are. It doesn't say that in Romans 4, 7, 17. It's referring back to this. Standing on the Word of God. It even talks about Abraham in there. About going through this. And coming to this problem or the temptation. Defeating it and moving on. He believed what God had said. That he would be numbered like the sands of the sea. And it goes all the way through. And he had to stand and he had to believe. Did he get to see the absolute belief system of that? Well, part of it, but not to the extent that he could ever even imagine. You see, you got to be a realist sometimes. You cannot deny the realities that are standing there in front of you. You can't deny those realities that are standing there right in front of you. When Jesus Christ was standing there being tempted... He could not deny the fact that darkness was standing there right beside him. It's about identifying what's going on in the situation and dealing with the situation through the purpose of temptation. You want to go back and read Romans 4, 17 now? Philippians 4, 12. Let's move on. I know both how to be abased and I know how to be abound and everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to be abound and to suffer need. Abased. What's that? About being made low. Abound. About being prosperous. It's about the balance of the whole thing because God wants us to get, wants to get us to a point where we believe, where we believe in him, where we believe in the full capacity of his stomach. Whether we're hungry, whether we're full, whether we have riches, whether he's got us broke at the point in time, he wants us completely relying on him all of the time. You see, God never intended Israel to ever stay in the wilderness experience. He doesn't expect you to stay in your wilderness experience either. It's not a permanent place. It's not a permanent residency. It was a temporary place then, and it is a temporary place now. And it's a temporary place as we go through the wilderness experience trying to get through and gain provisions. It's a constant wilderness experience. It's about defeating it. And every time your word, your wheel goes around, every time it rotates around, you go what? Probably 10 feet further. You go 10 feet further. Next thing you know, you can drive right out of the wilderness and right back to the homeland. But you got to keep going. That's how you make gains. That's how you travel with the Father. That's how you go from glory to glory to glory. But we have to learn absolute and complete dependency upon God in good times and in bad times. Philippians 4.3. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Again, we talked about it earlier. You can lean on here. You can lean on Christ. You can lean on the Father, part of the same process. But going through it and leaning on them through your wilderness experience. But it can't always be out of just necessity that you lean on him. You've got to be able to lean on him in the good times too. But sometimes that's where it absolutely starts. It starts when you're in your times of need. That's where we seem to rely on God. But in the good times, do we rely on God? We better rely on him in the good. Because otherwise you'll find yourself right back to step zero. Because he is the giver and he is the taker of everything. Of everything. You see, when you come out from your wilderness area, you get the promise. When you get out of the wilderness area, you get to the promise because it cycles back. It cycles back, and now you've achieved. Now you've attained. See, God blesses you, and God blesses people so that people can see you in your situation. Because he wants people to say, what are they doing? And oftentimes we look at it as finances. Well, try and get that out of your head. What about peace? 
What about you having a peace within your life? What about a smile on your face and the joy? It's about the fruit and the fruit of the Spirit. And if you go back and you study that series, you apply that stuff and people will see an absolute difference within your life. They'll see a difference in how you react to situations. But you've got to take that fruit of the Spirit and you've got to apply it right here to remain attached to the vine, to remain attached to the condition or the principle, to remain attached to the, to the, to the promise. And you keep that fruit going all the way through, the fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit of the Spirit can lead you right through in to the provision that's written in Scripture for the situation that you're trying to achieve. I just want to leave it there for this week. Remember, God will not give you anything you cannot handle. You can handle it. You can beat it. Find the Scriptures that you need. Find the scriptures that you need within your, within your walk. Whatever area it might be, maybe it's family, maybe it's business, maybe it's a military, maybe whatever aspect of, of life that you're dealing with that you, we work in, the, out of the five. Maybe it's ministry. Maybe you want more ministry in your life. Then fight through it. Fight through it. You're going to have to fight and fight and fight. We all have to fight. And we're all going to have to do things that we don't necessarily like to do. And if you really face something and you don't want to do it, it's probably the right thing to do. But if it's something that you really want to do, it's probably not the right thing to do. It's that simple. It's that simple. But get your flesh, body, soul, spirit, get them all lined up. Get them in tune and get them cycling within the cadence that God is cycling. Get them moving forward. Not behind, not ahead of the Father. Get them all in cadence and get your body, soul, and spirit within here in cadence and get it all in cadence with the Father. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Father, for the depth of your word. We thank you for the teachings that we can bring forward to inform your people, Father, how you operate, how you want them to do it, how you want them to beat darkness over the head in every situation that they face, Father, by applying your word and living your word through it. And we're grateful, Father, for what you've brought us through so that we can move from glory to glory to glory, Father, while we walk the face of this earth, manifesting your power, Father, to show forth your praises on here, on the face of this earth, to show this mighty God who we are, through the gifts that you've given to mankind. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Have an enjoyable week, everybody, and we'll see everybody next week, same time, same place.